Hi. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, Massimo Banzi from Arduino with David Mellis trying not to speak, but I'll sort of force him to. <laughs> so um, yes, I wanted to just give you a little, uh, uh, show you a couple of things that we, we've been working on for quite a bit uh, that finally we are sort of able to release and make available to the world. And so, and also we want to explain to you how this changes in a way what's happening with sort of Arduino, hopefully everything in, in good. Uh, we're still open source, just make, make, making sure that's, that's, so that's not, that's not, that's not going to be a surprise as we're still open source. So finally, after quite a lot of work, uh, we are very happy to announce that we finally it's possible, it will be possible to get the famous Arduino Due that we sort of announced we were gonna, um, that we were working on. And it was quite a, quite a bit of a project, so trying to sort of take everything that's working now on a sort of 8-bit simple architecture and sort of migrating it up to a 32-bit uh, Cortex M3 microcontroller, it's quite a bit of work if you want to sort of keep the user experience the same or, or very, very similar. And, and then, you know, the, the more you want to keep it simple and the more, the more you want to keep it sort of seamless, uh, the more work you have to do. And that's, <laughs> and we found that out, uh, you know, uh, by working on it for uh, quite a long, long time. But so here it is, so the final Arduino Due, as I uh, mentioned, is a Cortex M3 ARM processor running at 84 megahertz. And um, it, it has a few interesting features that uh, the old Arduino don't have because you know, they're sort of more limited um, type of processor in terms of power. So first of all, it's a powerful ARM processor. It has a lot of very powerful peripherals that are going to be very useful. So now, for example, all the analog inputs on this board are 12 bits. So you get a much higher resolution when you're using analog inputs. And the analog inputs are incredibly fast. So technically, it would be possible to sample them at one million times per second. That's what the data sheet says. Then to get there, we'll have to see <laughs> what's the speed. But you know, technically, it goes really fast. So also, the other interesting addition that this processor brings is that it actually has a real digital to analog converter. So you can actually do audio with it. And in fact, uh, when you sort of be able to download the software, you'll see that there we added the audio library that's able to play back audio on the digital to analog converter. And um, at the moment, the library plays WAV files, and there's also some OG player code available that originally was written by uh, Google. And um, the other f interesting feature that comes with this board is the fact that it has these um, two USB ports. So the one sort of at the bottom near the power plug is the classic USB plug that you use to program your Arduino. The other one is a USB on the go port. This means that you can use it both as a sort of client but also as a host. So you can plug devices in. So you will find some an interesting USB host library. So you can plug a USB mouse into the Arduino. You can control your Arduino with a USB mouse, or you can plug a USB keyboard and you can sort of type keys and you can use it like on a on a computer. And 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 there's also a lot of other uh, possibilities due to the this USB host. Uh, the board supports the ADK2 protocol designed by Google. So if somebody has followed the, sort of follows the Google Android development back in July, uh, Android Google released this kind of strange alarm clock called the ADK2. Actually the hardware inside that is, the, is an Arduino Duo essentially. And the development environment that they released for that board is essentially Arduino with ADK written on it. So essentially, a lot of the code that people have already running on uh, making Android speak to Arduinos just works on, on this board. And um, so there's a lot of Google libraries that you can use on this. Uh, 
that uh, Arabic sort of written for uh, sort of uh, advanced users, but you know they even implemented audio over USB and kind of strange, uh, strange other features. So, so I think it's I think it's an interesting um, and and powerful uh, development board that brings a lot of value to Arduino and also all of the shields that follow completely the Arduino layout release three version uh, are uh, working on this. So for example, our Ethernet shield, the Wi-Fi shield, other shields that we make that follow the R3 layout, they work out of the box and we have libraries for that. So here's a picture of the back. So one, it's still made in Europe, still made in Italy and um, so one of the interesting uh, things that happened uh, is that, again, as I said, we wanted to pe we wanted people to have the same experience when they migrated from the sort of old Arduinos to these new ones. So we had to do a lot of work behind the scene in the IDE. And I would like David to just give us a, a quick overview of what's happening with the Arduino IDE. Do you want to? So it's actually nothing um, that will require too much adjustment. I mean, the, the goal for the DUE was to provide kind of the, the same experience um, as with the UNO, the other boards. So the ID kind of looks the same, works the same, um, but under the hood we've made a lot of changes to make it much more general and flexible. So <clears throat> as you can imagine, um, you know, compiling code for a 32-bit ARM processor uh, is a lot different than for an 8-bit um, AVR microcontroller. So what we've done is, is created a, a system under the hood where you can plug in different tool chains, different um, compilation processes, um, all kind of easily configurable. Um, and obviously we're starting you know, with supporting the, the, the existing AVR um, boards and the new, the new DUE um, running on the ML SAM processors. But the idea is that this is a system that's very flexible that, that will allow people who are working with with kind of other processors and other architectures to plug in their own tool chains, their own compilation um, and upload processes. Um, so the, the, the software is becoming much more general uh, in a sense. Um, and more open. And more open. Yeah, yeah, in fact, um, so you don't, you know, you don't necessarily need to like, um, I mean, obviously all the source code is available anyway, you can do anything with it, but th this makes it kind of simpler. You can just change some configuration files and, and add support for new hardware. Um, and we're hoping in the future as well to make it even easier to kind of install some of those new new systems. Um, I should also say a lot of this work was done by uh, Christian Malie um, in uh, in Milan slash Torino. Um, so he's been he's been working with us and, and doing a lot of the the work on this. Um, thank you. So. I have, I have to say, is with the new IDE, you can program both kind of boards. And one of the things that was impressive, impressive for me at the beginning is that I had a program running on an Arduino Uno. Then I just went to the menu, I switched to Arduino Duo, I pressed the button, run, and it just seamlessly compiled and ran on the other processor. And that the first time was quite, uh, you know, quite a, gave was quite an impression on me because you know it's. I, we want people to be able to carry as much as they can from the current Arduino programs they have and move them on a much more powerful processor. And then we added some libraries and some other uh, sort of different kind of APIs that complement the basic Arduino API, adding more, more power. And also we have to thank a number of uh, Atmel engineers that would be very long to mention because they helped us figure out all the different uh, features of the processor. So all the Atmel team in Russe, France, we want to thank you for all the work that you did and all the work that you've done and releasing everything that they have done as open source. So in a way, you know, it takes a bit to work with these big companies and convince them to, you know, that open source is fine, you know, they're not going to, you know, that the company is going to fail because they give everything for open source. 
And um, so I think, you know, later on in the afternoon, we have a couple of demo sessions on the Due. So if you want to show up at the Arduino tent, uh, we'll show you the Arduino Due that plays a song, uh, we'll, you know, as an Arduino sort of synthesizer example that you change, you control the synthesizer by moving the mouse, you know, simple, simple examples. They show you that how, I guess, in the sort of Arduino tradition, doing all of these things is very simple. So, and it just works, which is, I think, one is still uh, very valuable in this uh, market. So I want to show you a couple of other things quickly. Okay, well, the Arduino will be, Due will be available in the sh online shops starting from Monday, October 22nd. So we start shipping sort of next week, more or less at the end of next week. And it should be in all the stores ready for the launch and will be $49 plus taxes, which is uh, considering the amount of stuff that goes into the board is still pretty, pretty, good, pretty good. The other thing I wanted to uh, tell you about is that, so we've been working for a bit to actually come up with a, an Arduino starter kit. So, you know, Arduino never really had an official starter kit and it's something that people have requested a lot of times. And so we just didn't want to do the same thing that everybody did. So we tried to kind of work a little bit on the sort of design side of things. So we made this box that contains, there's a fairly thick book that's beautifully illustrated and you have all the parts and you can, there's an, uh, there are 15 projects of increasing complexity inside that you can build. And we also give you some parts that we uh, digitally fabricated, like for example, there is this module where you can mount your Arduino and the breadboard, but then some of the parts of this thing that are made, they snap out and they become part of your project. So here you can see there's a motor with an adapter on it, which is made out of this piece of wood. So the 15 projects also include kind of cardboard parts in the kit that you can kind of put together and you can um, and you can um, sort of build different levels of com projects of different level of complexity. There are 15 of them. The first one doesn't even use the Arduino. And the um, last one is kind of complex also in terms of the mechanics. And also this is designed to be essentially a selection of parts that you need when you get started with Arduino. So you have an LCD screens, motor, servo motor, LEDs, sensors, and all kind of stuff. And um, I mean, it, we, think, we think people are gonna enjoy it. It's big and, big and thick. <laughs> it's a big, heavy brick. And, uh, and it got also magically, you know, designed, printed, made, assembled in Italy. And um, which is, you know, I like to repeat this because, you know, all of the stuff that we is around us is not made in Europe or in the US anymore. And so when something is made in Europe, in Europe or in the US, I like to kind of point that out. You bear with me as I point that out. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing I wanted to tell you is this new uh, thing that we, we came up with. And we realized a lot of people uh, are embedding the Arduino technology into their products. So we had a conversation with a number of people that said, you know, I would like to tell the world that my product has Arduino inside. And I would like people to know that they can use Arduino to reprogram my product or my device, or I would like to give back to Arduino for providing the technology that I'm now using. You know, in a way, if you look at Kickstarter, I don't know, probably 90% of the hardware projects on Kickstarters are either variations of Arduino or they have Arduino used as the base technology for it. So in a way, we had contact with a number of people that wanted us to kind of figure out a way to make that more official. But obviously, uh, we didn't want to sort of have people to go through the process of licensing the full Arduino brand, which is de designed for people who make development boards. So we came up with this thing called Arduino at heart. So this, this idea that you know the heart of your application is based on the Arduino technology. So if you have a product, I don't know, an alarm clock, a watch, uh, an LED display, a toaster, 
uh, refrigerator or whatever that has or wants to have Arduino inside. So we'll basically negotiate a deal for you to be able to, to use this brand and then obviously be mentioned on the website. And also there's also a lot of times people ask us, can you send us a list of like 20 cool products made with Arduino? So clearly, you know, the people who are part of this program, they'll be the ones that we sort of send out. So in a way we wanted people to be able to sort of highlight and advertise that they use the Arduino technology and so, and but also we wanted to be in direct connection with them so that we can support them and help them. So this applies only to kind of products. It doesn't apply to yet another Arduino compatible board. It doesn't, we don't really want to fill up the Arduino space with the 55 variation of the same thing. It doesn't make sense. People, when they look at the Arduino product line, if there were 55 variation of the Arduino Uno, they would get incredibly confused. They already get confused now, imagine with 55. But if you're making a product, uh, and you know we have been talking to uh, companies like Adafruit, once has a pocket, has a, a wristwatch that has an LED display on it that they would like to release as following this program. So. If you want to make a product, you can talk to us. Next week, we'll have the details up on the website, and there'll be a special section of the website uh, for this Arduino at heart. Good. So this is all the new things I wanted to tell you for today. And um, then I want to leave some time for the next speaker, uh, who is one of the inventors of the AVR processor that is inside uh, the Arduino board, so uh, you know it would be good to hear from him the story of how that happened, and and then maybe afterwards, if somebody has questions, we'll have a little, we'll have a short Q and A for people that wants to ask questions. Okay, thank you. See if technology works first. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to everyone that's uh, showing up there to listen to us. Even though it stopped raining, you are still here. So that's a, that's a good sign. So uh, as Massimo said, I was one of the inventors of the AVR that sits on uh, most of those Arduino boards that a lot of the people here are, are using and out there. So it's a... Uh, quite amazing to go walk around and see what all those kids are doing and if you see all those uh, these enthusiastic small young kids and where are they going to end up I mean uh, and then I started to think about when I usually present about the AVR history I present about uh, starting from the university and what happened from there and the, the business part of it but I was thinking that going to a maker's fair like this with, with people at all ages I wanted to go a little bit uh, back so I did some re research on my own background as a young maker so uh, that's one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit about in the beginning. I'm from Norway, so we are all, uh, all European so far. <laughs> so uh, this Arduino board is, uh, is one of the uh, really amazing things that didn't exist when I was young, but we had other ways to do stuff. But quickly first, I mean, the AVR microprocessor is, uh, comes in very different variations. And I'm not going to go into detail on all the products. This is not the product pitch. But I mean, if you compare the, the, the development or the, or the performance of a computer from 1949, a Manchester computer, 700 instructions per minute, used 3.5 kilowatts and filled up a mid-sized room. If you compare that to this tiny device there, which are one of the smaller devices, 20 million instructions per second. And we are talking microwatts or milliwatts uh, in, uh, in ACQUI mode. So it's a huge difference. I mean, there's very little things in the industry that's been going through the same amount of changes a semiconductor. So, who was ALF? <laughs> and, and what really happened? I mean, this is me, and uh, th that's me, and it's my, my sister. Uh, I would call her my assistant at that time. Uh, she would probably call herself my test rabbit or, or something like that, especially for my gravity projects and, uh, and maybe the, the chemistry projects. 
Uh, worst case, I was throwing her out of the, the roof of the house. I was, I was building a hang glider, and it completely failed. <laughs> it just fell straight down, and I had to pull thorns out of my sister, or my assistant, or my test rabbit for the, for the next couple of hours. The house back there was a small little house we had outside our house, and that was my detective bureau, it was my newspaper headquarters, it was the radio station where we sent out uh, radio uh, in, in the neighborhood until the police came and took our equipment down. <laughs> Electronics lab, you name it. We did everything in there. We were really, really doing a lot of different things. Most dangerous things were we, when we made the nitroglycerin, uh, but that's a different story. I remember my first maker project because the challenge was to wake up in the morning and I didn't really want to wake up with, with, a, with a bell. So uh, I, was just, I was just thinking, what, was, what do I remember the most as my first project? And I took this, this little wake up clock and a battery, two wiper motors, and instead of waking up to a sound, it just opened my curtains in my room and I, I woke up by the, by the sun. That's what I remember. And then I asked my mother, what do you remember as the most interesting project? And she said, I mean, most interesting? Well, what I remember the most is when you, when you put a huge antenna on our house. <laughs> this is a little bit bigger than it was in real. Uh, but she came home from work one day, and I had mounted a huge antenna. Uh, I was living in Norway. I was uh, on the radio with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Iceland and around the world, and we, of course, we had Different, uh, tra different antennas for FM transmission in the street because we had our own radio program. We were like 12 years old, right? So, so uh, it was quite interesting. So that's, this hole on the, down to the right there is, is actually taken a couple of days ago before I left Norway. So the big hole I drilled into the wall of my house is still there. So I was just saying to my wife, what happens if, if our kids do like this? And said, that will never happen. I mean, like, we're not going to let them do that. But after seeing all the kids around here, maybe we should need to have that discussion again. She's here somewhere. So, and then I, of course, asked her, because we were, uh, at, when we were 14 years old, we met, and so what do you remember the most for uh, when I was younger? And she said, I remember your, your, um, your, uh, okay, your room, because your room was so messy. I mean, this is just my desk, and you see the loudspeaker there? That's my surveillance system. I had microphones in the living room so I can listen to my parents and then... <laughs> I, I took an old Thunberg uh, um, player and I hooked up cables inside because there was a microphone in there and I hooked it up to my loudspeaker so I can listen to what they were doing and uh, of course I was, had to act like I was surprised at birthdays and things like that and my parents were non technical at all. I mean, they, they, I could draw a cable to the whole house and they wouldn't even notice it was an extra cable. <laughs> so that was the benefit of that. Uh, the, the but the instrument there is an FVR meter. It's a measure. Uh, it's a measure um, the antenna um, um, adjustment. So you can so you don't get any reflexes from the antenna. So I was quite advanced at that time also to be to be a, a young guy. But whatever. So let's. Uh, so now technology failed on me. Oh, that's good. Let's do backup solution. Um, I think. Okay, backup solution three. Okay, university. I think that's when I came to university, I mean, I was really, I really wanted to go into electronics because everything I was doing as a kid turned more and more into electronics. My gravity project stopped, my, my, my chemistry project stopped, and my dynamic project had a pretty brutal stop, and, uh, and then electronics was, was left. And when you start in university, of course, you, you, you find people that are, are similar, so I, I built a lot of friends that are also building companies today, and we had an Omega workshop uh, kind of ch little room in the, in the basement of the university where we could do all kinds of projects. Uh, I'm a windsurfer, so one of my big projects was also to do windsurfing uh, wind measurements because we, we didn't want to drive out there uh, and have, uh, and have uh, sit there waiting for wind. So, so I made a lot of different wind measurement instruments we could put out there, we can call them and they could report back to us and they can send us messages when there was wind, etc. Even at my first job, I told my boss that I need to have one criteria in my, in my contract. If it's more than 12 meters per second, my wind station is going to call me and then I have to leave. <laughs> and she, he, okay, he okayed that, actually. So that was uh, one of the interesting things. But I think important here is, is the friendship and, and the people you start developing things with, right? Because you can do so much alone, but if you, if you are more people, we all know how creativity is. I mean, if you have an idea, other people bounce up that idea, you come up with new stuff, and then you improve it, and you improve it, and you improve it. 
it goes much, much quicker when you are, when you are uh, more people. Technology is back, working. Okay. So university works. A little slow. Uh, university was the place where we really started doing the microcontrollers. I was using microcontrollers before that and also at university. And, uh, but then I met Vegard, Vegard Volan, which is one of the co-inventors of the AVR. And, and we started to do some kind of uh, projects around microprocessors. And we tried to find new ways to do things. And we did analog stuff. We did microprocessor architecture studies and this kind of thing. So we, we actually met then and then we started to working together uh, when we graduated. I graduated in 92. So that's where I really met my, my companion. So then the question was more, what did we want to do? Because everything we was using at that time was, uh, I mean, for us it was complex things. I mean, I used microchip a lot and I woke up in the morning and I had to read the instruction set again because it was hard to remember. It wasn't really easy to use. And developers tools was really expensive. So if you wanted to, for us as a student, it was really expensive. It was more for the, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, big companies to, to get the real tools. It's a little, a little bit similar like photography. I mean, before, only the professional photographers had the equipment. Today, all of us have more equipment than we need, more equipment than we know how to use. But it, that's not the limitation anymore. And that's sim the similar thinking we wanted to do with the microprocessors. We wanted to make it available for everyone. And of course, we wanted to also improve the, the technology. We wanted to do something that was, that was better. If you look at the first spec of the AVR, the, uh, there was a few things we really had to do. I mean, we wanted to do a fast processor. We were using microchip, which was four cycles per instruction. And when we studied microprocessor architectures, we, we had learned something about RISC processors that was really, really fast. And they were really, really fast, but the problem was that the code was really big and it wasn't really optimized for C language or anything like that. So our goal was to try to take the, the risk processor concept and, and, and make it also very efficient for the C language because we saw that the C language was really taking off. And I asked Massimo here, or he told me here in, in, uh, before we got, got on stage that one of the reasons he, he was choosing AVR was that it was easy to use, it had the built-in flash and E squared, which means that you can, you can reprogram it and it's perfect for this kind of project, like to get started with things. But it also, uh, it actually turned out to be so cost efficient that it was also perfect for, for high volume production. Low cost development tools. I mean, I remember the, uh, the MP labs and the development tools at that time were several thousands of dollars. And very few students can, could, really, could really use uh, that much money to get started with the microprocessor. So we came out with uh, free development tools, free simulators. We came out with, uh, with uh, because we had in system serial programming, we could, we could actually just use the device as your debugging platform. We also made a $200 in circuit emulator that uh, could be used by more professional companies if they wanted to. The other thing which is important is that this is, uh, was made by engineers for engineers. And what do I mean with that? I think the way we communicate and connect with the, with the community was really, really important. We started to build a community uh, from day one, and it became really a product that spread very widely before any of the competitors took us seriously. The vision we had at that time was that AVR was supposed to be the most used and recognized microcontroller in the world. And uh, I mean, we were really ambitious, but we, uh, to do that, we had to have some kind of partners, right? Because we, we couldn't do this from little Trondheim uh, just by ourselves. So the question was, where do we go to, 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 uh, to find someone that can fund this? Because we need a lot of money. And for two young people in Trondheim, which is not like Silicon Valley, to, and to get the, the amount of money we needed was, was really hard. So we had two people, two companies we were looking at. We were looking at Hitachi, and we were looking at Atmo. And why did we do that? because we had flash technology, because we had to add something to this processor that was different from the others. And of course, my Japanese isn't very strong. Uh, my English is a little better. So, so we went to, to America and we went, uh, went to, met, uh, to meet At Atmel in California. And for us, I mean, Silicon Valley was the dream, right? We jumped on the plane, we came to a place where everything was so big that we had never seen anything like it before. And uh, we, we saw, I mean, 
we, we, we got down to the Atmel office and we, we got in there and we meet this kind of lot of these serious people, serious corporate people sitting there in front of us and we were like dressed up like we have never been before with ties and all these kind of things and uh, and we were sitting there and, and then he, uh, the CEO was in the room and he said, uh, hello guys, I have 10 of you guys in here every week. You have 10 minutes to convince me that this is a hundred million dollar business. And I looked at Vega, we had like 45 slides. <laughs> starting with bits and bytes and technology and on the last slide we actually had hundred million. So we looked at each other and we said, we need to do something, 10 minutes. Okay, let's flip the, flip the stats. Because you could do that at that time, because we had overhead projectors and, and these kind of transparent slides. <laughs> Today that would have ended right there. But at that time, we could flip it. So we put the 100 million slide, 100 million slide on there, and we, we moved backwards to slide number one. And he was sitting there for three hours listening to us, listening to how we could build a 100 million business based on this technology. So, and then they set us home. And uh, three months later, they call us back, come over, we want to look more into this, and we, we believe in your plan. So that was really the beginning where we started, we built a development center in Trondheim, and we started to build AVR products. I, I still remember the first 1200 device that came back in Christmas 97, we were sitting there Christmas Eve, everything didn't matter, we were just testing this device, it, got, uh, it started to work, and it, it, we could actually use the first part to start sampling customers. What we have never told them to date was that 100 million Norwegian kroner is only 60 million <laughs> US dollars. So that's how you can stretch your goal in just a little fraction of a time. We actually made 100 million dollars accumulated in five years, and that was uh, the target. Five years and one quarter, and we had a reason for that, that extra quarter. So I think the, uh, it's been a really exciting story. I mean, if you, if you look at the design centers we have doing AVR products today, it's uh, all around the world. I mean, 1,200 people in total that is doing those products. And more than a billion dollar out of Atmel's 1.6 billion is AVR-based technology today. So it's quite, quite significant. The, the revenue curve is something I always put in there, even if it's a, I, I'm proud of this curve. I mean, there is a, quite a big and deep growth from the beginning. From a project starting at the university in Norway by two students and up to the business that it is today. And of course this is not just about me and Vega. I mean we, we build a great teams, we got a lot of great people. This is a teamwork in all of the world with all the, all the different people that have been involved. And it's, it's been a great teamwork and, and really a really exciting one. We sell, with AVR technology, there's three million devices every day shipped around in the world. That's quite a high number. Uh, we uh, also, one of the best, biggest successes we have had with one device is the Max Touch devices that is uh, used in the touch phone. And this device is used by many of the top manufacturers of touch phones. And we launched the first, first device in 2010 in April. In the first year, we sold for $140 million, from April to December. The year after, we sold for $375 million. That's one device. And I think that very, very few um, semiconductor companies have experienced this kind of growth in, in this kind of product. So for us, well, this is, I mean, from being two, two unimportant people, uh, having 10 minutes to show this, we build a team and we really execute it. So it's possible for everyone, no matter what kind of starting point you have. I mean, but you, what you need to have, you need to have that passion. You need to want it to happen. You can't just think about the money and well, I'm going to get famous and all that. You need to have uh, the real passion for what you do. The other thing which is important, that, and that brings me a little bit into the uh, Arduino and the, the work with the Arduino board, because that's one of the, honestly, the most exciting things uh, I have been through with my industry to see all those people starting to use uh, the or micros, and we built it very early. Uh, what we call AVR Freaks, which is an, a website that I'm, I'm sure some of you have been to, maybe, maybe any of you, and where we really connect with the community. And uh, it's a little bit like Linux. I mean, you try to get everyone to work for you and to really help you build something. And I think that. Uh, 
If you look at the next step on this, come on, here you go. Uh, the Apple and the Arduino cooperation and the, the partnership there. So if we look at how we split this market, and this is my view of it, I mean, Muslim might, uh, might have a little different view, but I think if you look at from a tier one customers where, where we as a company are focusing on, and you go down wider and wider to more and more people, the Arduino really makes it possible for everyone to start using microcontrollers or technology in general. A microcontroller is not that important anymore in, in this picture. It's more that they can start to use advanced technology that enables for them unlimited possibilities. And I must say, when I was looking at our booth today, we have this robot competition, and we have those uh, those groups of people that are competing. I mean, right now, uh, and they have they are all into it, right? They have a problem because the, the robot goes out of the track and they drops the tennis ball or whatever, and they go back and they program it, and and they are sitting there so intensely working on this kind of things. That that really makes me proud. I mean, it's it's more important than any big tier one customer. I mean, this, to see all this happening because that's the, that's the future. I mean, that's that's really where we get the energy for the future. I had a communication bureau in, in Trondheim that was visiting me the other day because they wanted to build a kind of consortium so they uh, could enable innovation in, in Trondheim. So they wanted me to be on that board and they wanted some other executives from other companies. I said, forget it. It's not about us. We are, we are done. I mean, you have to connect with the kids. Go to a maker fair. See what's going on. See how you can mobilize. Everything. Instead of throwing snowballs, you have to create a big snow avalanche that you can't stop. You either run with it or you're just down. And that's what I see here when I when I look at the Makersphere thing. It's it's just it's just so 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 amazing. And I mean that's why you're all are here. So I I, uh, I think you, most of you agree with me that that's so powerful when it works. And it even motivates uh, uh, the uh, the more business oriented people too because they see that wow this is just so big. I remember when, when, when Massimo and his team was in Trondheim, I think a couple of years ago, and uh, we, we, we met there and they had, they produced maybe 10,000 units or something, something like that of the Arduino board, which was a big stretch at that time. Today, I mean, just sky is the limit. And uh, we're going to support them uh, a, a lot on this. I mean, this is important for us. It's, it's the most exciting things to do. And, and we're going to support them as long as they, they want our support. There's one more thing I want to, uh, want to, to mention also. I, I've been touching it a little bit. I mean, how many people have heard about Samuel Pierpont Langley here? A few people. In, uh, in uh, the end of 1800s, he was the uh, uh, 1898, he got $50,000. And he was like nominated as the person to make the uh, commercial aircraft, or to make aircraft where you can put a person on with, with an engine. He was a person that. Uh, had access to all the engineers, all the high-level people at Harvard, every resource you could think of to make this plane. But he was, he was so, for him, this was so important, and he always had the press there. He was really, he was really about himself. Uh, and he was also afraid, because instead of trying to take off with the plane, he was using a catapult. And of course, if you don't fly them, you, what happens? I mean, you, you crash, and you have to rebuild your plane. And over water, so he actually drowned the whole the whole plane a couple of times. He never really made it. I mean, the per people we real recognize as the people that invented the plane was these guys, right? The Wright brothers. And what was the difference? I mean, the Wright brothers they were flying September uh, December 17, 1903. The press got to know it a couple of days later, but they were there when people in Langley crashed. But no one heard about the Wright brothers. Because they were not interested in their money. They were not interested in all those exposures. I mean, they just wanted to fly. They, they so badly wanted to fly because they wanted, they, they think that, they thought that if I can just make this work, I'm going to change the world. That was their passion. And they got people with them with the same passion, right? Because it was not about the money. They didn't have the resource, but they had so passionate people around them that really, really made it happen. And they are today in the history as the people that, that were flying. And I'm, this story, I think, is, is really showing what, what, what it's about. It's about passion, it's, it's about inspiration, and it's not about the money and who has access to the biggest resources. And that's what I think about when I walk around uh, here in the, in the megasphere. And that's really what excites me. So, make it happen. Thank you.
Sorry about the technology, but uh, we don't really need the resources, do we? <laughs> There's supposed to be a Q and A, I think. I'm here for the A, and not for the Q. <laughs> so. Okay. If anybody has questions for yes. Well, um, <laughs> well, in our case, it's because people kept asking for an ARM, Arduino running on an ARM processor. So that, were, that was what a lot of people asked. So we thought it was a good choice. Yes? Uh, yeah, it's you. Do it. Well, there's only one thing that's like, so the question is, is going to be, the other thing to do is it going to be more harder to start with for a beginner, I guess. I think the only thing that's kind of probably tricky is the fact that it runs at 3.3 .3 volts while the regular Arduino run at 5 volts. So clearly there's some differences in the way you kind of wire up the circuits when you kind of go through the examples when you learn. But after that, it's generally this kind of the same, it's the same Arduino stuff. We normally tell people to start learning with the Arduino Uno or, because the Arduino Uno is, is a tank. You know, I've, it's really robust and it just works and and you know, so you, when you're learning, you don't have to be afraid to damage anything. And also the idea that you can remove the processor, so it makes you, f this idea that you could fix it if you wanted to and all that, actually makes you um, be more careless and in a way you learn more. Because you're not afraid of breaking, if it breaks and just replacing the processor. So in a way, as a learning platform, I think the Uno still has a lot to give, but it is possible to, to learn, uh, you, you can do it, no problem. Yes? Yes. Sorry, I, <laughs> but it's me and on here. Okay. Yeah. Well, so we're going through the documentation to update it for the DUE. So when you look at the tutorials on the website, there will be an indication like you're doing this with an Arduino DUE, do it like this. So it should be pretty straightforward for a lot of examples. Well, well, who's? No, I think that um, they will run in parallel for a while, for, for a long while, I guess, because you know, there's probably, there's probably about now 30 books, more or less, written about Arduino in different forms that mention the Uno, and there's so much stuff that just runs on the Uno. There's also a lot of people who made shields that I have not updated to the latest sort of layouts. So in a way that the Uno will just continue, and also because it, people use it in schools. Schools sometimes take a long time to adopt something, and then when they adopt it, they want it for the next foreseeable year, so. Oh, it's not, it's not a, <coughs> so the, the, the question is about the decision of not incorporating Ethernet into the DUET. Actually, one of the reasons why it took us a little bit longer to do the Arduino DUET is that because we waited for this processor to become available, the, du the Sun 3X, because the Sun 3X has Ethernet on board on the chip. So it's not about, so we didn't want to launch 25 boards the same day. So we start with one so that people can start adopting the technology. And there is a board with native Ethernet coming out, and which is going to be very efficient because the, single, the same single chip does you know, Ethernet, 
uh, USB host and all the other things. So the flash is 512K. I'm looking at date, yes, nod. And the RAM is something like 64K RAM, or is in the region of 64K. I think the usable one is like something like 53 kilobytes or something like that. But yeah, that's more or less the, um, the quantity. I mean, the, the nice thing about these devices, they have quite a bit of RAM compared to the small AVR. So you can actually start processing nasty things like XML files that kind of destroy your memory just to say yes. You know, so in a way, <laughs> it's good to have more RAM. <laughs> well, clearly it's not something that you would <laughs> use to be in the high-end stereo. So it has a 12-bit stereo digital to analog converter. But it also, the processor also supports the I square S bus, I don't know the exact name, but it's essentially, if you then attach a, a, a codec at the end of this bus, you can get digital quality audio, no problem. And the, the board is um, fast enough to be able to even decode MP3 files. So, and uh, also one of the features that we will explore in the, in the sort of near future on this board is the fact that it has very effective DMA. So effectively, if you want to play uh, like a chunk of sound, you just put the data into a buffer and you say, play it, and you can do something else. So you can actually develop applications that can sort of do audio and something else at the same. So the, with this, we're just opening the door to like a million cool things. Uh, curious, are you going to take advantage of any of the ARM's uh, built-in hardware debug capabilities? And let me ask you a question too. Uh, <laughs> does that not have any plans to bring these trace capabilities from the ARM modules down market, so like the floor drop, because like uh, modules using the base trace matches on ARM are known as pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a nice thing for, you know, these engineers to have more debug capabilities. Yeah, and, and I think it's a, it's a good point because if you look at our roadmap for ARM devices, what we try to announce there is that we are, we are building all the things we have done with AVR and all the, the things also into the ARM portfolio. So, so you will see more, we integrated the debugging into the AVR studios. You can, in, you can debug ARM and AVR in the same studio. Uh, but you can al we also move the peripherals into it. You're, you're moving more the, the, what you're talking about, the trace and the scan pattern possibilities and all that. Uh, we we're building more and more into the ARM. So, so we, we take all the best from the AVR and we, uh, we also build that into our ARM product portfolio. And we, we are licensing all the important ARM devices. And so you will see a lot of exciting ARM products coming from, from Apple in the future. Oh, accessing also what you, you just said. So in terms of the DUA, the, the, so the DUA exposes this JTAG connector, which works very well with a couple of uh, uh, open source dongles that you can find on the market. There's one in particular that we are testing right now, and I'll sort of talk about it more when the product is released. Uh, but you can already do a lot of debugging with this sort of little JTAG, and also the board itself supports this SWD sort of protocol, so you can actually debug with just two wires connected to the processor. Yeah, it has a JTAG, it has a 14. Well, they Uno supported more or less the debug wire thing, but. Uh, you had a question a long time. <laughs> Clearly, we are looking at a lot of those things. <laughs> but I, I don't think, we, we never came to the point that there was something that we, re, we were really satisfied with. So we never sort of got to the point that we were releasing any of that. But we are definitely always looking at a lot of stuff. That's what I can, <laughs> that's what I can say without. Uh, I'm just checking this. Okay. Oh, there's a question here. Yeah. Well, again, the, the Arduino Leonardo, in my mind, at some point, will probably replace the Uno, in a way, because it has, it's simpler, it has more functionality. But in a way, what you get with the, the Uno is there because, again, there's a lot of work 
and documentation <laughs> and books and tutorials and courses that have been written about it. So clearly, we want to keep it. Also, uh, for example, it started to become impossible to find processor in the deep package. So, for example, the processor on the on the Leonardo only is available as an SMD chip. So, and the at mega three two eight is what we can find now in a deep package that for the foreseeable future will continue mm. to exist. <laughs> say, no, the, no. <laughs> say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, so I think that they all fill different sort of market segments in a way. And also in a way I like the idea that, you know, I want to see what happens, what people start doing and how things evolve before we sort of. I think also important is, I mean, from the way we see it, is that to work with an 8-bit AVR device, especially the smaller devices, which are very, very easy to understand from an architectural point of view. So for, for younger people to learn about the microprocessor itself, to understand more about architecture and things like that, I think the, the, the clean and, uh, and uh, home again structure of the, the AVR is, is really, really beneficial. If you start with a too much high-end processor, you will miss some of the basics, I think. Yeah, I think one of the very nice things about the sort of basic, the processor in the Uno is that in a way it's like very simple inside, so as a beginner, you can actually start learning what a microcontroller is by actually studying that. And it has all the elements, all the peripherals. And then you can graduate to more complex processor by learning on something that's kind of simple and understandable. I mean, even the ARM started off as something incredibly simple. No, they were, but then. <laughs> so what is, what is so the question is is it about the pricing or is it about the well the question is <laughs> so we are dependent on the prices that we get from Apple. yeah I promise so I promise you can are, are, we, are we recording now <laughs> are we, are, we are streaming live but uh, I promised him uh, competitive prices thank you <laughs> Well, obviously to say, obviously the, 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 there's also an issue with pricing with Arduino that is due to... Okay, form factors, we are looking at making smaller Arduinos and there will be a new product that will allow us announce in a, a little while that kind of fits in that category. But then it's also a question of that what Arduino wants to do in terms of products because you know if you look at the sort of compatible derivatives clones similar platforms semi-compatible uh, probably I don't know last time I checked it was probably a hundred and something but I checked two years ago and then I stopped checking because it's probably like 300 of them right now so if we had a product line of 300 items people go crazy no already there's a lot of product items in the Arduino for my taste there's already too much stuff but I mean, one of the reasons I think the Arduino is so strong is that, especially when I met you first time, and I was like, what's your business model? How are you going to make money? And you looked at me and like, money? I mean, I don't care about the money. This is my passion. I want to really make this available for everyone. I mean, that was really your passion when you, when you, when you talked about it. I think, that's still, I think that's still why it's so strong. I mean, there's a lot of competitors trying to grab a piece of that market and coming out with, with solutions. But I mean, look about what's behind it. Look about the energy behind it. That's when it will go. Well, that's when uh, what's going to be really, really important as well. Of course, you don't really want it to be too expensive, but I think that's that's an important part of the whole thing for this type of product. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So obviously, keeping everything open source, it is difficult. It's very difficult. Also because we obviously have a set of <laughs> self-generated disadvantages, like for example, the fact that we manufacture in Europe obviously makes our product more expensive. Uh, so clearly the people who sort of make copies of the Arduino in places where it's much cheaper to build things uh, obviously hurts us. Also the fact is that, for example, we tend to get involved in painful projects. Like when we made the Wi-Fi shield, 
we didn't want to just take a module and just stick it on a PCB. Anybody can do that. You know, I was doing that in high school. So the question is that we wanted to give an architecture that would be open at every level so that people can go in, understand all the different layers of a Wi-Fi module work, and they can hack. But it took us months to do it. We spent a lot of money. We put it online, and then obviously the risk is that the, the, the morning after, there's a random Chinese guy or American guy that just clones the whole thing, puts it online, investment zero, uh, and they have a product that people choose to buy. So, but obviously, until there is people who believe in what we do and they are willing to buy some of our products to support what we are doing, we can continue. At some point, uh, you know, <laughs> It, it, is, it is difficult sometimes to explain why you do certain things not because of, you know, uh, business culture. Because if I had to bring in an, somebody with an MBA from the MIT, they would say, okay, here we change everything, we make everything closed source, go to China right now, fire all the Italians, fire all the Americans. You know. <laughs> why are you paying all this much money to this guy? You know, so that clearly we're not doing it only for, for the money, and we hope that a lot of people believe that and sort of continue to support us and obviously I think what's more annoying for me is not the people who make copies, clones, or it's I'm, I'm more annoyed at the counterfeit copies, the people who just copy everything and they sort of, in a way they cheat people that sometimes some people think they're buying an original Arduino, they think they're supporting the Arduino project and they're effectively giving the money to somebody that just makes a few boards, sells them on eBay and disappears the next morning. So that I think is hurting, is hurting a little bit. And uh, all the ways that we came up with that we could protect ourselves from that, uh, they would close the platform. I mean, I could ask Atmel to give me a processor that I only have. So even the cloners would buy from me. But then when I was discussing this with one of my partners, Gianluca, I said, then the next day the community kills us. They will hate us deeply. And I, you know, at some point, Arduino, like everything in life, will end. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>